Ma chambre a la forme d'une cage Le soleil passe son bras par la fenêtre Les chasseurs à ma porte comme les petits soldats Qui veulent me prendre Welcome back to Your Brain, A Personal Tour. This is Steve Saltwick. Today's seminar is about the structure of memory. Memory is a slippery term. Some people use it one way, some people use it a different way. For today, we'll use a definition that memory is the storage and retrieval of knowledge about the world that changes our behavior. We'll look at memory in three different aspects. First, what are the critical parts of the brain that store memory? Second, do memories move around in the brain, in one part of the brain early on in your experience and then in a different part later? Lastly and third, can we manipulate memory to relieve human suffering? My one sentence summary of the seminar is that the rich episodic memories Proust read about eventually become totem poles as the Pacific Northwest Indians carved, but the totem poles are in your brain. How does that work? Well, welcome to the seminar. Let's find out. Memories can be verbal or nonverbal. In some memories, we can be in a Proust story, a rich and detailed recollection of an event perhaps long past. Or in another, we might be in a Pacific Northwest Indian totem pole story. The memory reflects the gist of a story, and it's recreated anew with each telling or remembrance. A good example for a totem pole memory or story is Goldilocks, and the gist is a bear, a bull, in a bed. A knowledgeable storyteller, your brain, would recreate the story from these mnemonics. But there's a third kind of memory, and this memory is not verbal at all. It is a change in brain structure that encodes an interaction with the world such that behavior is different after that interaction. Look at this field. This field has previously interacted with water, which resulted in a gully. Future interactions with water in this field will behave very differently because of this gully. This is a memory not involving words, but of a change in structure. I want to begin our discussion of memory with a personal encounter. This is me about to undergo my second hip operation on the 16th of June, 2014. I'm accompanied by the brilliant surgeon, Dr. Shelby Carter. My first hip operation was in March and was extremely helpful. I just couldn't wait to have my second hip operation to fully enjoy the benefits of having new hips and an old body. But this picture almost didn't happen because a few days earlier, on June 10th, 2014, I had the following conversation with my wife, Becky. I was sitting at the breakfast table drinking coffee when Becky entered our kitchen returning from work. She said, why aren't you at the doctor's office? I said, what doctor's office? Becky said, to prepare for surgery. I said, what surgery? Becky said, now getting a little concerned, for your other hip, it's time to do the right hip. I said, I've never had hip surgery. Becky, now getting very concerned, goes, Yes, you did, in March of 2014. I was very frustrated now, and I said, No, I didn't. If I had hip surgery, I'd have a scar. I then proceeded to show her how I had no scar, at which point I said, Oh, no, I have a scar. And then Becky goes, Let's take a little car ride. She didn't tell me we were going to the emergency room, but that's where we went. As we drove, it became clear that there were some things that were not quite working with my memory. I did not remember going to India in January of 2014. Forgetting something within six months of this episode is significant. We'll return to that. 
However, I did remember the Beck I did remember Becky and the dogs. I could remember the layout of our home of 20 years. I knew where to go to find my shoes. I remembered how to put my seatbelt on. I also remembered the habits that one normally has. I could ask reasonable questions. For example, I knew that if I had hip surgery, then I would have a scar. So I could do deductive reasoning. But I had a big problem. Right. And that problem is illustrated on the, in the following dialogue that we had as we drove along. Becky would ask, how are you doing? I would say, I had hip surgery. Yep, three months ago. Where are we going? And, and you're sure, I had hip surgery. Yes, look at your scar. Really? Really, are you sure? Are you sure I had hip surgery? Yes, you had hip surgery. Uh, wait a minute, where are we going again? This conversation shows I was clanging. I could not incorporate the context of what was happening right now into my memory. I could focus on it for a little while, but then distracted or looking at something else, I would return to a fact that I just could not represent the fact that I had had hip surgery. This leads us to look in some specific places for where my problem lay. The good news was that after 24 hour battery of tests against my body, my brain, my heart, my blood flow, my everything, I got a diagnosis. And then right after that, I got a new hip. And boy, am I happy about that. But what happened to my brain? Most likely, I had had an interruption of blood flow from the internal jugular vein to that old friend of ours, the hippocampus. That interruption of blood flow acted as a reset. In essence, the interruption of blood flow caused my hippocampus to reboot. The medical condition is called transient global amnesia, TGA for short. My hippocampus had to restart, and as a function of that restarting, I had the memory episode. We'll use this story to set our framework for the seminar today. Why did a hiccup in my hippocampus result in a failure to retrieve memories? Why does it make me clang over and over and over? I'll probably never recover the memory of the four to six hours of the actual episode, but soon thereafter all the other memories, for example India, came back to me. What's going on here? Well, if you want to talk about memory, there's a specific animal that often springs to mind, the elephant. Legendary for their memory, it does turn out that elephants have a hippocampus 40% bigger than a human hippocampus prorated for body weight. It also turns out that elephants have one of the most complex societies on the planet. They comfort others, they perform death rituals, they honor their elders. I wish more humans did that. The association of the hippocampus with a complex society is the first hint that there might be something more to the hippocampus than what we studied in the previous seminar, and that's important. But there's also another good reason to be aware of the elephant and their hippocampus. The elephant is only distantly related to humans. Our family tree diverged about 60 million years ago. Elephants, it turns out, are most closely related to manatees. So if elephants and manatees have a hippocampus, then, all the hippocamp then the hippocampus could be a fundamental building block of memory for virtually all mammals. We can learn a lot from studying how the hippocampus works in such a widely diverse set of species if we can keep them around. And for help keeping them around, this is one fortuitous outcome of research on elephants. Nowadays, poaching is not the most pressing danger for elephants. Competition for forage with native farmers is the new challenge. Farmers often kill trespassers on their field. I'm thrilled to note that as a result of some practical scientific research, it has been shown that elephants are truly scared of only two things, humans and bees. A bee can sting the end of the trunk, and that makes even a bull elephant cower. As a result of this research, enterprising farmers are now constructing low-cost bee fences, hives hung between proles amongst their fields. There are two outstanding results. Everyone can afford to protect their field without killing elephants, 
and the collected honey can be used for food and or a crash crop at the market. If this is not a win-win, I don't know what is. In the previous seminar, we looked at the hippocampus and found that there were unique neurons within the hippocampus called place cells. Those cells fired when an animal was in a particular part of space. Well, it turns out the hippocampus is much more than place cells. We'll look at that in this section of the seminar. To make a long story short, the hippocampus is essential for what is called episodic memory. Examples of episodic memories are do you remember where you were and what you were doing at the time of 9-11? What you were doing and who you were with when you learned of the assassination of John F. Kennedy? How about when Neil Armstrong stepped upon the move? These are autobiographical memories, almost like a Proust story. They are rich, they are detailed, we remember them vividly. As it turns out, the hippocampus is essential for this kind of memory. Episodic memory is not a YouTube video of the events of your day. The hippocampus seems to thread time and space into a personal fabric of experience, involving you at the center and then the what, where, and when aspects fused into your experience in a unique way. While machines are used to measure linear time, see the clock marks in the middle of the diagram on the right, our brain experiences time as an ordering of events, in other words, I went skiing downhill, then trudged up a hill, then had to shovel some snow, built a fire, etc. The metrics of this experience are far more complicated than that shown in the picture. In fact, we're just starting to understand the experience in detail. But we do understand the basic points, and that's what I'll present today, our best understanding of episodic experience as of 2019. I want to refresh your memory about place cells and how they relate to a rat thinking. When a rat runs in a familiar maze, he goes through a series of spatial locations. Those locations are coded in the hippocampus by different place cells. A place cell fires when the rat is in the purple zone, a different place cell fires for the yellow zone, a different cell for the red zone, etc., etc., all the way through the maze as he runs it. But there's another time that a place cell fires, and it's called a sharp wave ripple. A sharp wave ripple is a very quick burst of place cells, about a tenth of a second long, way too fast for movement. And these place cells fire in sequence. So in essence, when a sharp wave ripple occurs, the rat is thinking about a path. He's not moving in that path. This happens much too quickly. The rat is thinking about going on that path. That path can be described by the sequence of place cells as they fire. On the bottom, the sequence of color-coded place cells within a short wave ripple decodes a trajectory in a maze. Go purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and it takes the rat through the maze. Fantastic. But, this is a big but, it turns out that's not the only way that hippocampal place cells fire in a sharp wave ripple. Take a rat that's been trained to go through a maze to obtain a food reward. If we look at sharp wave ripples when the rat begins, we would see the firing of place cells anticipate the path that the rat is about to run. In other words, we can predict the path the rat will take to the food. But once the rat gets to the food and starts to consume, we see something very different. The place cells fire in the reverse order. It's as if the rat is thinking, how did I get here? That's probably a good thing to remember. The reward system is going to be active when the rat is consuming this food. So at the same time the reward system is active, place cells are firing in reverse order in the sharp wave ripples. They're basically laying down a path to this food that will be strengthened by the reward system. This mechanism is what underpins the deliberative learning we studied in the last seminar. This, method, this mechanism is a very, very important discovery. Place cells within sharp wave ripples show what is about to happen in the terms of the behavior of an animal. They also explain how an animal learns when they discover a reward. Way, way cool. But wait, there's more. 
it turns out that place cells also measure time. Let's train a rat to run on a treadmill for varying lengths of time. If we look at the hippocampus, we can find cells that measure time, much as other place cells measure spatial locations. Look in the section of this diagram where we see four hippocampal cells, A, B, C, and D. The activity of these cells seem to measure time intervals as the rat runs on the treadmill. Cell A marks the beginning of this time interval, cell B the next, cell C the next, and cell D marks the end. We've shown three separate runs on the treadmill, so there's three rows to each cell tracing. The experimenters were quite careful to run controls to ensure the hippocampal cell activity did not merely measure the level of effort or how many footsteps or paw steps the rat had done. The activity of these cells measure time. Hippocampal place cells can also reflect learning. Let's see how. We take a rat and find a place cell for position one in her cage. Position one is at the red dot. We find a hippocampal place cell that fires rapidly whenever the rat is in position one of her cage. There's another position at the top of her cage. We're gonna call that position two. We train this rat that one of two flower pots can be in those positions. One flower pot, labeled X+, has a distinctive odor and is always associated with food. The rat can dig in the sand of this flower pot and she will always find a food reward. A different flower pot with a different odor, labeled Y-, minus, is never associated with food. The flower pots are changed randomly between position one and position two as we train the rat. After she's learned this task, we probe for place cell activity in response to either flower pot in position one. Remember, we're recording from a place cell that at the start of training was preferential for position one regardless of what was there. Post-training, when flower pot X plus, the food pot, is in position one, we find a very strong response from the place cell. However, if flower pot Y minus, the no food pot is present in position one, then the place cell fires at a much reduced rate. Yes, indeed, this is a place cell, but the important thing is that the place cell does not just encode a place, it reflects learning about that place, and that is essential for understanding what place cells really are. But before we can conclude what place cells really are, we need to look at one more aspect. It turns out that hippo hippocampal place cells can be social and track the position of others. The coolest way I've found to show this is with an experiment with bats. Somehow, intrepid experimenters invented a way to record from bat hippocampal place cells while the bats were flying. So the cells were active at no place on a level maze, but when the bat was at a particular point in three-dimensional space. The experiment used a demonstrator-observer paradigm. In this type of an experiment, an observer bat watches a demonstrator bat fly to one of two positions. After the demonstrator flies to a particular pole, say A, the observer bat is supposed to follow. After training, not only were hippocampal place cells found in observer bats, which represented their own position in space, but social place cells were found that represented the demonstrator bat's position in space. So if you're confused about why I'm calling cells that detect space, time, learning, and social elements place cells, it's understandable. Let's get a better name. Hippocampal cells certainly represent a lot more than place. What they really do is build a context. What do I mean by context? Well, let's take a familiar example. In an office, there are many different kinds of elements. There's chairs, there's a desk, there's a filing cabinet, there's a clock, there might be papers. All of those are individually perceivable objects. They're found in many different kinds of experiences, Amazon web pages, Costco, office depots, etc. In an office context, there's an integrated whole of them in a particular place at a particular time. So your office is a particular desk with a particular filing cabinet, a particular chair, a particular clock, 
particular papers all integrated into a perceptual whole. This is what I mean by a context. This context has all the details of a Proust story. It's rich. You can imagine yourself within that context. The essential function of the hippocampus is to encode space, time, learning, and social variables into a context. Since that context can be used to affect behavior, which is our definition of memory, then there is at least one type of memory processed and held by the hippocampus. An interesting aspect of context cells is that they are active not just in the experience of that context, but in the recollection of that context. We can see that in the following video clip. We have a human subject on an operating table, and we're going to record from single hippocampal neurons. When they are active, the cells will make a pop on the audio. While we record hippocampal activity, the subject watches short video episodes. What the subject is watching is shown in a short statement on the top of the file. When he gets to the Tom Cruise episode, the hippocampal cell goes crazy. We'll play lots of different kinds of video clips to see that this is unique to Tom Cruise. And it sure seems to be unique to Tom Cruise, specifically on that episode with Oprah. So there you have it. This cell, when it experiences a video of various things, reacts to Tom Cruise. Let's have the subject now just think about what he saw freely recollecting various scenes in his mind. So this is the subject remembering and then telling us what he's thinking about uh, as he remembers those scenes. His voice has been masked for anonymity. So there you have it. A context cell that was active during the experience is absolutely active during the recollection of the memory. Once context cells are built in your hippocampus, they can be associated with other experiences. If you have an aversive experience in that office, let's say a confrontation with an office worker, then that office context can be associated with that aversive experience as if it's Pavlovian or associative conditioning. An interesting aspect of context cells is that the response can be evoked by just part of that context. It's called pattern completion. When you remember or experience just a portion of that office, all the other memories associated with that office can be called to the fore of your brain. The presence of the office can bring forth an aversive emotional response even with the person absent. The context is being completed by the hippocampus into the whole office, including the memory of the aversive experience. Now let's hear from Homer. The first thing Homer would say is, wow, place cells are really context cells, and not only for the perception of context, but also for the memory of context. The same cell that perceives the context is the one that is associated with the memory of that context. The second thing Homer says, and this demonstrates his lack of literature knowledge, but he hits the nail on the head anyway, that for this type of memory, these context cells encode a rich, detailed, and autographical story, just like a Proust story. Knowing what we now know about contact cells in the hippocampus, let's revisit what was happening in my hippocampus on June of 2014. 
When I had my transient global amnesia, one significant fact was that I couldn't incorporate things that were happening to me into the context of the current time. I had no recollection of hip surgery, even though I was told I had had hip surgery, even though I saw my scar. I couldn't incorporate that into the context of what was happening now. I also couldn't remember that I had been to India with Becky six months prior. However, I did remember Becky. I did remember our dogs. I did remember the layout of our house. So clearly I had some memories which I could still get to, even during the restart of my hippocampus. A few weeks later, I could access the memories of India. So some memories were not only in the hippocampus. The question is, where were they? The answer to that question means we have to look at dreaming and sleep. In The Tempest, Shakespeare says, We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Shakespeare got it right. The creation of memories depend upon sleep. Human life would be impossible without sleep. Your brain needs sleep, and we'll talk about that in this section. Dreaming is an activity of your brain during sleep. It's not essential. Certain antipsychotic drugs eliminate dreaming, yet st people still live healthy lives. But dreaming is something that has fascinated man for as long as history has existed, and we need to talk about it in our search for memories. Sleep is divided into two main categories, as shown on this diagram. There's something called non-rapid eye movement sleep, or NREM for short, and something called rapid eye movement sleep, or REM for short. The various stages of sleep within these categories are shown on the left. Sensations and perceptions vary across the modes of sleep. Most people think that dreaming only occurs in REM sleep, and until quite recently that was supported by the output of research literature. But, as it turns out so often with research, the results you get depends on the question you ask. If you ask people going into the first stage of non-REM sleep, anything going through your mind, you will get a dream report 80 to 90 percent of the time. If you wake people up in a stage of deep sleep, there's something called sleep inertia, and it has a major effect on dream reports. People awaking from this stage of sleep need time to reorient, to get back up to speed into what is happening in the now. Dream reports are very unlikely at this point in time. But if you sum over all the stages of non-REM sleep, dreaming is reported when you ask the right question between 25 and 75 percent of the time. Clearly, we dream in almost all stages of sleep. If you look at rapid eye movement sleep, it turns out that the vast majority of rapid eye movement sleep occurs in the womb. A baby before birth will spend up to 24 hours a day in rapid eye movement sleep. That sleep percentage declines over time, becoming almost vestigial-like once we reach adulthood. A fascinating theory of REM sleep function, at least in the womb, is that during REM, a pattern generator in the brain causes the baby's limbs to move. That movement then feeds back, via somatosensory input, into the brain and it helps various parts of the brain wire together. This pattern generator doesn't go away as we age, so there's still bits of it in our sleep where this pattern generator is generating movements. That may cause our body to move and it may be what causes active, lucid dreaming. There is a part of your brain that is intimately associated with dreaming called the temporoparietal junction or TPJ for short. There's two significant facts we need to talk about the TPJ. The first is that the development of this part of your brain parallels the reporting of dreaming in children. Young children don't tend to dream. They tend to develop that capability over time and that time frame matches the development of the temporoparietal junction. Both develop after you're born and typically reach full development around five years of age. The second fact is that in adults, some antipsychotic drugs basically shut the TPJ down. When this area shuts down, patients report the global cessation of dreaming. 
there's about this, something about this part of your brain seems to be associated with dreaming. In fact, it's associated with something far bigger than that, something that's unique to humans. But we'll have to talk about that in Seminar 5. Today, we're talking about memory and sleep. One thing that sleep has unambiguously been related to is the reduction of synapses in brain cells. Recall from our previous lectures that a synapse is where two brain cells communicate. It's highlighted on the left in the red circle. A synapse is essential to learning. New ones grow as we make new memories. But wait, brains are typically in skulls of a fixed volume. If you make new synapses every time you make a new memory, won't we run out of room eventually? Yep, we will. So how does Mother Nature address that? Sleep. Sleep reduces the number of synapses in your brain. In essence, sleep helps you forget. Research confirms that this happens in a wide variety of animals, as diverse as fruit flies on top and mice on bottom. Actual micrographic photographs of synapse reduction are shown on the left for one of each species. There seems to be a total, some sort of grand total, that is a maximum number of synapses that a brain can have. Sleep reduces the net number of synapses in your brain to relieve the pressure of daily learning. Now that's an interesting fact, but there's even more interesting facts that can be discovered about the structure of a memory in your brain. The first fact we want to note is that sharp wave ripples are repeated in certain phases of sleep slow wave sleep. On the left hand bottom of this slide we show a familiar diagram that represents a sharp wave ripple, a sequential firing of play cells decoded as a path in space. Sharp wave ripples also occur during certain phases of sleep and that's shown on the right. Sleep is divided into several stages but for our discussion now we really only need to be concerned with two major divisions. Sleep that occurs in the first half of the night rest period for virtually all mammals is called slow wave sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep. The second phase of sleep is called rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. Sharp wave ripples occur in slow wave sleep. We can see that in the rat EEG and we can also see that in the human brain EEG. In humans, sharp wave ripples are called spindles. Sorry about the terminology mess, but they are the same thing. Note we see representations of thoughts being repeated in sleep. Maybe that might keep them from being forgotten as a result of synaptic reduction. Further, if those electrical patterns are related to the formation of memories, we should be able to manipulate them. And it turns out we can. To show this manipulation, let's set up an experiment. Our goal is going to be to create a memory. Because if we can, then we can better understand the brain processes that underlie it. First, we're going to take a rat and we're going to put an electrode in his hippocampus. We're going to record place cell activity and sharp wave ripples. We're also going to put an electrode into the reward system. Remember, we dealt with the reward system in seminar two. By stimulating the reward system, we can behave as if we have fed the animal some food or given him some kind of positive reinforcer. So we've got two electrodes, one to monitor what is going on in the hippocampus and the other to activate the reward system. We have a computer to control all of this so that when the computer detects a sharp wave ripple, it can stimulate the reward system automatically. Prior to training, we place the rat into a circular enclosure and let him wander around. We find a place cell. In this instance, the place cell is shown by a heat map of activity. The area shown in red, that's where this place cell is most active. We're now going to let the rat go to sleep, and we're going to monitor his hippocampus. When a place cell fires, we're going to stimulate his reward system. In this phase, the rat is asleep. He's not moving around. It's as if He's dreaming about moving around, and whenever he dreams that he is in the location represented by this place cell, we're going to stimulate the reward system. 
after the rat wakes up, we're going to put him back in the environment, and lo and behold, he makes a beeline for that area of the maze or enclosure associated with the place cell. Amazing! We have created a memory. The rat never experienced food or any other reinforcer in that place. We've done this all electronically. We monitored the place cell of the hippocampus and then stimulated the reward system whenever that place cell fired during sleep. If we can create memories by pairing sharp wave ripple detection in the hippocampus with stimulation of the reward system, can we do the opposite? Can we disrupt learning and memory by disrupting sharp wave ripples? It turns out we can. The experimental apparatus is shown on the left-hand side. It's an eight-arm maze. A rat is always put into the middle of the maze to start. Three out of the eight arms are baited with food. Those are shown by the small red dots at the end of the arms. Each day, we give the rat three training sessions. He's placed in the center, he gets to explore, and find the three places of food. He gets three trials a day, there's a three-minute rest between each trial, and then at the end of three trials, there's a one-hour sleep-rest period. During that sleep-rest period, we're going to monitor for sharp wave ripples, and whenever we see one, for the test group of rats, we're going to disrupt them by zapping the hippocampus. In a control group of rats, we'll zap the hippocampus the same number of times, but we'll do so randomly with respect to sharp wave ripples. Another control group will not be implanted or zapped. They provide a baseline activity for the task. We train the rats day by day by day, and the results are shown on the right. We see that our control animals learn this task to a very high level of performance, greater than 90%, over the course of about 15 days. The control group, which had random stimulation of the hippocampus, learned just as well as the implanted controls, the just normal rats. However, look at the test group. They're shown in red. The test group has a severe impairment on this task. By disrupting sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus, we are disrupting learning. We are disrupting memory. So, we can manipulate memory, we can actually create them, and we can actually disrupt them by manipulating sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus. I know, I know, I keep talking about rats. Aren't there some experiments with humans? Well, yes, there are. We can also show how memories can be improved during sleep with the help of the human hippocampus. The experimental paradigm is on the top part of the figure. Human subjects are trained in a card task. When an odor is experienced, a subject has to pick particular cards from a set of cards presented on the screen. When odor number one is presented, the subject has to pick one set of cards. When odor number two is presented, he has to pick a different set of cards, etc. The reason we're choosing odor is that we want to manipulate the brain during sleep. Most sensory inputs are shut down during sleep, but odor is not. Remember that from Seminar 1? The olfactory system has a direct input to the hippocampus, and we can use that to our advantage in this experiment. As the subject sleeps during the course of a night, we monitor his brain waves, and when the subject enters various stages of sleep, and that's shown on the shaded part of the diagram, we're going to present one of the odors associated with a particular pair of cards during training. The next day, the subject is tested again. If the odor was presented during slow wave sleep, we get a significant difference. The subject who experienced the odor performed much better than controls. Presenting that odor during other parts of sleep, for example, rapid eye movement sleep, or during wakefulness had no significant effect. We were monitoring the brain as the subject was presented the odor, and the hippocampus, the bright yellow dot in the image of the brain below, was the most active area. So it's true for rats, it's true for human beings, the hippocampus in sleep is extremely important for the formation of memories. We're now ready to explore how memories move around and are changed as a function of sleep. The bottom line here is that sleep produces totem poles. 
Remember, totem poles represent the essence of a story. They're the distilled elements separate from all the autobiographical stuff. In this section, we'll see how sleep produces memory like totem poles as those memories move outside of the hippocampus. A good experimental protocol to show the movement of memories is the social transmission of food preference. That's a mouthful, but it makes a lot of sense if you think about it from a rat's perspective. In this kind of experiment, we take two rats, one's called an observer, the other one's called a demonstrator, kind of like the bat thing. We ensure they trust one another, if you will, by having them share a meal. They eat some well-known food, like rat chow, together. After that, the rats are separated. The observer goes away into a completely different room. The demonstrator is then given some uniquely flavored food. Turns out, rats love cinnamon on the rat chow. After the demonstrator has eaten the cinnamon, we bring the observer rat back together with the demonstrator and they socially interact. When rats do that, they smell each other's breath. After that reunion, we present the observer rat a food choice. One choice is the cinnamon, which the demonstrator rat has eaten and that the observer rat has smelled on his breath. The other choice is cocoa rat chow, which neither rat has eaten. When presented this choice, the observer shows an incredible preference for the cinnamon-flavored food. That makes a lot of sense. If you smell a unique food on the breath of one of your rat pals, and he's not dead, well, probably that's a pretty good food to eat and a good memory to have. Let's track the development and movement of a memory in this kind of experiment. In this instance, we'll use cumin as the unique taste. After the demonstrator-observer reunion and food fest, we study the rat over the course of about a month. The rat is allowed to sleep on its normal sleep-wake pattern. We're going to see which areas of the brain are involved over the course of time. And what we find is that early, say in the first couple of weeks, there's an interaction between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex of the brain. There's a synchronization, if you will, between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex that establishes this early memory context. Both areas of the brain are required for this to happen. If the hippocampus wasn't there, there wouldn't be retention of the memory. If the frontal cortex wasn't there, there wouldn't be the retention of the memory. You need both. But then later on, the memory is in the frontal cortex only. It has moved and may be transformed. That memory now isn't in the hippocampus. It's in the frontal cortex only. The hippocampus could be inactivated, much like mine was on that fateful day of June of 2014, and the memory would still remain. So here's a good example of how the passage of time with sleep causes a memory to be consolidated outside the hippocampus into other cortical areas of the brain. That's extremely important, and that's the reason why I remembered my wife Becky, our beautiful dogs, even when my hippocampus was restarting. Now, before we finish this section, I want to look at one more detail of memory as it synchronizes between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex because it's important to see how memories not only can move about, but how they might be transformed. In this experiment, we challenge human subjects with a fairly complicated mathematical task. We don't need to be concerned with the details of the arithmetic. What we really need to understand is there's a trick. There was a hidden pattern in this numerical task such that the final answer was predicted by the second number in sequence. None of the subjects were told this. They were given a fairly complex numerical task to do. They had to process through that task, and then some were allowed to sleep on it. Others were not. Then they were tested. A main point here is that nobody, told, nobody was told there was a shortcut to solve this challenge. If the subjects were allowed to sleep, 60% of the subjects reported that they gained insight and found the shortcut. This result is outstanding. It says that memories, as they consolidate, are subjected to abstraction. Hidden rules or patterns are brought out when the hippocampus and the frontal cortex interact. 
The frontal cortex is the one that is responsible for drawing out these rules as a function of sleep. So if your grandkids are cramming for a test, you might want to tell them to get some sleep because neuroscience says they will be amazed at the kinds of insights and observations their brain can come to when you just let your brain sleep. Let's try to tie all of this together. The hippocampus deals not only with the frontal cortex, but also several other areas of cortex. It's synchronizing, or talking if you will, to several different areas of your brain during the creation of a memory. Early in the stages of memory formation, the interaction has the characteristics of a Proust story. It's rich, it's detailed, it's autobiographical. You are remembering the sequence of things that happened to you. As sleep occurs, the memory is consolidated. It moves to other parts of your brain and it's transformed as if to a totem pole. Elements are abstracted, rules are evaluated, insight is gained. The autobiographical, the you part of the memory, may well decrease. The memory goes from being a Proust story to a totem pole abstraction. Abstraction has evolutionary benefit. It gives you the rules of the road in much less space. And if you're going to learn new stuff, you need space in your brain. Additionally, by moving the memory into many different areas of the cortex, you protect the memory. If the hippocampus goes crazy, you would still retain the memory or totem pole. Let's get Homer's take on this. Homer is ecstatic. He says, hey, sleep is important. It forms long-term memories. Yay, sleep. Homer, as you know, loves to sleep. Now he's going to think that his sleep is justified by neuroscience. But Homer also has an additional point, and that is hippocampus plus cortex interaction creates totem poles. It abstracts information. It creates insightful observations depending upon the capabilities of an animal's brain. I think Homer's pretty well nailed it. These are the amazing properties of sleep and the formation of memories. In our last section, we take a look at memory manipulation. Is it possible to alter or modify memories, and would that be a good or ethical thing? I think we agree that there's some types of manipulation that are not ethical. Erasing the memory of an innocent bystander, for example. Mother Nature gives us memory to remember unpleasant situations for a good reason, so that we don't repeat them. However, if we have the ability to alter the emotional content of a memory, would that be a good thing if it improved the life of an individual? As an example, let's take anxiety disorders. These disorders are very common. They affect the lives of millions of people in the United States and around the world. They reflect intense emotional dysfunction, from soldiers returning from a tour of duty, irrational fear of animals or heights, dysfunction associated with abusive relationships or instances of rape. 30% of our spending in the United States goes to some form of anxiety disorders. The cost of the economy is significant. Over $45 billion are spent trying to alleviate the suffering that comes from anxiety disorders each year. If we could separate the emotional dysfunction from those memories, would that not be a good thing? Would that not be a good thing to use technology and understanding that we've investigated today? Let's take a look. The example I want to use is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It occurs in soldiers returning from a tour of duty, and it's thought to involve overgeneralization. By that, I mean there's a memory of a combat experience which has some significant sensory element. Let's say some kind of burning wreckage. After returning home, the soldier experiences something that's similar, like a backyard fire pit, and there's an overgeneralization. That causes recall of the combat experience. We saw how the hippocampus can jump from conclusions and perform something called pattern completion. One explanation of a PTSD sufferer is that their hippocampus cannot discriminate between the elements of the sensory experience 
and the former soldier is thrust back into the intense emotion of combat by an inoffensive cue. Someone with a healthy hippocampus um, and pattern completion can separate those two environments. The backyard fire pit is a context separate from the combat experience. In this former soldier, there's not overgeneralization. There's not the intense emotional dysfunction associated with combat and everyday experience. How can we go about relieving the symptoms of this de debilitating anxiety disorder? Well, it turns out one way to do this is to grow new cells in the hippocampus. In a normal hippocampus, we do grow new cells throughout the course of our life, about 40,000 a day. Sounds like a lot, right? But that's not much when you got 86 billion already there. It's called neurogenesis and it occurs in very few parts of the brain. However, stress has an adverse effect on the growth of new cells. Combat experience is the textbook definition of stress. So from exposure to combat, we probably have a decline in the growth of new cells. But many events can increase the growth of new cells in the hippocampus. The passage of time, certain kinds of anti-anxiety drugs, electroconvulsive shock, and exercise and meditation all have positive effects on the growth of new cells within the hippocampus. The time course is noted on the bottom right of the slide. It will take two to six weeks for this kind of treatment to result in the acceleration of new cell growth. That matches the time course of psychotropic drugs in terms of treating the behavior of PTSD sufferers. This is a new insight and originates from research quite recently. The research extends our understanding of how PTSD involves a lack of discrimination of context and it gives us hope that with various avenues of treatment, we can alleviate, alleviate the emotional dysfunction that comes from this anxiety disorder. There's also new therapeutic avenues for treating anxiety dis disorders, which can utilize the fact that the hippocampus is always learning. Because of that fact, we can combine non-fear memories with fear memories of the past to reduce emotional content. For example, a soldier suffering from PTSD can, can recollect fear memories in an environment of measured breathing, of general wellness of the body, etc. As this new memory is consolidated, those fear memories are going to be intermixed with non-fear memories. That means we can use inexpensive, non-invasive techniques, not drugs, not electroconvulsive shock. We can reduce future anxiety from fear memories by coupling them with non-fear memories. This is a wonderful avenue of therapeutic approach. It deals with meditation, it deals with exercise, and it's an exciting area of research. We'll hear more and more about it in the future. But it also has implications, and that is a memory is really the last retrieval of an event, not the original event. If I'm asked to recollect an event that happened a long time ago, I'm not going to get the original memory of the event. I'm going to get the memory as it's been recollected over time and coupled with all the other context when I was recollecting. That has implications for eyewitness testimony, especially as it relates to events far away in time. Our legal system is grappling with such effects. Neuroscience can inform those discussions, but new legal scenarios need to be envisioned for what we now know to be the complex dimensions of memory and its transformation in your brain. There's late breaking news on this front from here at UT. The Drew Lab in the Department of Neurosciences has published breakthrough research on the nature of memory. The memory that allows a behavior to cease is a separate memory from that which allows a behavior to be expressed. In other words, absence of a behavior does not mean that there's no memory for what led to that behavior. This is a very important uh, aspect to the treatment of PTSD and other forms of mental decline. It offers hope that memories may be recovered even when the behaviors seem to indicate the behavior is gone. Let's take a look at an example using Pavlovian conditioning. Recall that in this kind of behavior, an animal reacts to a stimulus, for example, a bell, which predicts food with the same type of behavior they associate with the food itself, in other words, salivation. There is a unique memory in the hippocampus for this decision to act. But what if we decide to stop delivering food after the bell? 
Well, ultimately, the salivation behavior stops. The animal does not react to the bell as they do to the food. And in this situation, we call it extinction. Based on the work at the Drew Lab at UT, we now know that extinction is underpinned by a new memory. It overrides the memory of conditioning and stops a behavior. But the original memory is not gone. It can come back with the passage of time. This means that the two memories contend for the control of behavior. Recall in Seminar 2, we learned that the basal ganglia arbitrated this kind of action. It is the go-no-go -no -go system of the brain. So we want to minimize the fear response in PTSD training. We want to ensure an instinction memory is strong and maintained. We need to keep reinforcing it to maximize the reduction in PTSD behavior. However, I want to emphasize the point here. No behavior does not equal no memory. It's typically dueling memories associated with the hippocampus. If we're treating a behavior that looks like memory loss, we do not need to give up hope. The memory may still be there. It's just being overridden by another memory that we need to address. This is an exciting result, and more research will be fascinating, especially in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Last time for Homer today. Homer says, your mom was right. You should face your fears with support. By bringing up your fears in a safe, non-fear environment, one can alter the composition of the context of that memory. That's a potent way to assist addressing disorders. This technique is improved with meditation and exercise. I think it's important as we deal with anxiety disorders and other syndromes affecting large portions of our society. The second point Homer would like to say is, why don't you try exercise and meditation? It's amazing the amount of scientific data that is coming out in support of exercise and meditation for their beneficial effects on the hippocampus, on the brain in general, on the body in general. That is significant to remember as excellent tools to manipulate memories that underpin a significant source of suffering in our society. This concludes Seminar 3, The Structure of Memory. I hope you enjoyed it. In Seminar 4, we'll begin to look at the question, what is really so unique about human brains? Up till now, we've talked about basic brain processes that are similar amongst most mammals in the world. In Seminars 4 and 5, we'll explore the uniqueness of the human brain when compared to other species, especially primate species. We'll see some fairly surprising results. For example, how the search for bananas in the forests of Africa set the shape of your brain. That brain shape set the stage for the right-hand part of this diagram, a magnificent sculpture of the itinerant Japanese priest Kuya who lived in the 10th century. No animal other than a human could produce the right hand of this slide, but no human would have emerged without the left hand of this slide. I look forward to you joining me for this next fascinating journey. This is Steve Saltwick. Every